on a Friday night. The Late Night with Locks grand finale. I just want to say thank you to everyone, man. This has been a, a, a hell of a ride. Really have enjoyed it. I want to welcome everybody back to Friday's edition with Late Night with Locks. We're back here in the original studio. Uh, a little hot outside, so we decided to bring it inside. I can't thank all of you guys for the love that you have continued to show us all this time through the pandemic. It's been one hell of a ride, and we're excited to be able to bring you tonight's edition. Uh, we've got some people on that have become really dear friends, as well as some people I grew up uh, as a child uh, just, just admiring so much. Um, before we get started, I want to thank our guests from uh, Tuesday night. Chaz French, my nephew, today is also your birthday. Happy birthday, Chazzo. Uh, excited for you, man, and your new project. I want to thank Citizen Cope out there in uh, Venice, California. Copey, appreciate your time. And, of course, former Turk Ricardo Young, along with Tobias DeRozan. We want to thank you guys for coming on, sharing your newest project, uh, Victory, Maryland, which will be coming to the area soon. Just want to thank all three of you guys for the show on Tuesday. And as always, we want to continue to thank our frontline workers who have just done a tremendous job helping us work through the pandemic, uh, putting their lives on the line for us to be able to continue to do what we do. We can't thank you enough. And I also want to thank and wish all of our graduates, man. We've had so many, whether it's college or high school graduates that are going to be graduating this weekend uh, or have already graduated throughout the state of Maryland, all the different universities. I know this is a different time with you guys not being able to do it in person, but we want to wish you guys luck in your future, and we know you guys will do great. So congratulations to all of our graduates as you guys embark on the next chapters of your life. Uh, what a run. You know, this show has been such an awesome platform for me. Uh, it's been a way to get my mind off of all the things that have been going on with the pandemic but also been a great opportunity to reconnect with all things DMV, all things DC, all things Terps, all things Maryland, you name it, man. This show has done a lot for me and has really been great to do. Um, but I'm ready to get started uh, with the Star Static cast. Uh, you know, this first guest, man, uh, is somebody that I'm fanboying again. I had Cal Ripken on a week, couple weeks ago, uh, but this guy is a guy that I grew up. He put DC boxing on the scenes. Uh, he was a, eight, a 76 Olympic gold medalist, brought the gold home uh, for us. Uh, he won world titles in five different weight classes uh, and is the undisputed welterweight title uh, holder of all time. Uh, a member of the Fab Four, uh, being a part of those great battles against some of the top fighters, Duran, Hearns, Hagler, you name it. Uh, the first boxer to earn more than a versus the 1980 boxer of the decade. And, you know, I had a chance to see a few of his fights. Uh, I couldn't say, I could say a lot more about this guy, but I got to stop because he's on. Let's welcome Sir Ray Leonard. What's happening? What's happening, champ? All right. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing great, man. You have no idea how excited I am to be able to have you on late night with locks. Uh, man, as a kid growing up having the opportunity just to, to see your just what you did for this community, winning the gold, uh, bring it back to the D.C. Maryland area. Had a chance to watch you as a kid when you were training over at the Sheraton in New Carrollton. Uh, that's how far we go back. But what's been going on in your life with this pandemic? How things been treating you? Ben, it's been a challenge. It's been uh, an opportunity to be with my family and, and I was gonna say friends, but no friends had been around me. But it's just been a weird thing, man. It, you know, life, life is so challenging. Right. Um, no matter what your platform is, but you know what? We'll be okay. I'm an optimist by nature. Right. You had to be an optimist in my lot of uh, work, boxing. No, no doubt. No doubt. Well, I know this, champ, you, you just celebrated your 64th birthday, and watching you, I follow you on Instagram, and I know you're a guy that stays in great shape. You know, I just saw Mike Tyson on his Instagram hitting the body bag, and, 
and, and, and looking at you being in great shape, what's the chances we're going to see Ray Leonard get back into the ring and give us a three-minute shadow box in the tutorial? Any chances of that chance? Just show people how to shadow box or actually... No, just a little workout. Just just the old-fashioned, you used to get in the ring. Man, it was like art. It was like art watching you work. I can I can do that. Just you hit the bag and, and jumping rope and road work and what have you. But I'm telling you something, no one's gonna ever hit my face again. <laughs> Maybe my wife. But uh the only way I would get back into the ring is that uh I ch you ch you know, you challenge me. Uh oh. Mm. Hey, okay. I, I don't know if you saw my video. I hit the heavy bag in my little teaser that you were coming on here. And I had a few combinations, but uh, I, I don't think I'm ready to get in the ring with you, with, with the champ, man. But what are you doing to stay in shape? Because you look good, man, at 64. What, what things are you doing to keep yourself in such great shape and condition? You know, I work out pretty much every day, particularly cardio. I do a lot of, uh, I play tennis a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, I'm not a great player, but I hustle. Um, I, I love it. I play with my wife's girlfriends. And they're, they're pretty fundamental. I love it, man. And you check this out. I lose between, especially if I'm fighting, I'm playing hard, fighting, uh, playing hard. I can lose between five and ten pounds in a couple hours. Wow. Just yeah. Just, just chasing the ball. Chasing the ball. Wow. Yeah. Well, my first memory of you, Ray, is, you know, Lawrence Putney Brown, my childhood best friend who I know you, you, you remember Putney uh, from the fight game. Oh, wow. Huh? Yes, yes. Wait, that's way back. Way back. Well, we came up to the Cap Center, and we came and watched the, the Dave Boyd Green fight. And we was up way up high. I was 11 years old, and we watched the Dave Boyd Green fight. And I, if I recall, I think Roger, your brother, was on that card as well. And, and Fort, yeah. Fort Gant. Uh, Johnny Gant. Johnny Gant that night. Uh, I can remember when you were getting ready for the Durant fight. We hopped the subway. And came out in the right. Carrollton, and you were in the Sheraton, and you opened it up for people to come and watch you do your thing, your your your, your little warm up stuff. I mean, what what? Tell me this, man. You've had a lot of great fights. You helped put the DC fight game on a map. You did it for a long time. Five different weight classes. But who who would you say was your toughest opponent? And I know you get asked this a lot, but you know. Yeah, and it's you know it's hard to answer that question because justifiably it's hard to answer that question because. Fighting Roberto Duran, who they call Manos de Piedras, hands of stone. Yeah. That guy hit me so hard. I, look, I turned around and said, who else is in this ring? Fighting Wilfred Benitez, my first title. He was tough. He, he, he became world champion at the tender age of 17. Amazing, amazing talent. Uh, Tommy Hearns. Oh, I mean, just, just, just a killer. Man. He, unbelievable. And Marvin Hagler. I mean, Marvin right. Hagler, without question, one of the greatest middleweight fighters out there, champions. I mean, so I can't say which one. Right. Uh, because they all were tough, man. They all had their own significance. They all, I mean, each one of those guys took me to the limit. No question about that. Right. Well, growing up in the D.C. area, uh, being a boxing fan, which fighters did you look up to as you started climbing? I know you went – Obviously, fought in the Olympics, but who were the fighters that, that back Ray home. Leonard looked into? Who's that? Back home, back in DC, naturally, my brother Roger right. and Johnny Gant. Right. I yeah, love yeah. Johnny Gant. Yeah, Johnny Gant. Johnny, you know, Johnny didn't get his, he was such an incredible boxer, but he never, he came along at a time that he didn't get his, he didn't get what he deserved. Like most fighters, they don't get what they deserve because, uh, each year, each generation, uh, with the Olympics, the exposure from the Olympics was a was a huge asset to me. I mean, boxing was on network television, ABC, CBS, NBC. Right. So people knew who I was. Got it. Well, I know this, doing some research, and I know you grew up in the Palmer Park area. Uh, being the head football coach at Maryland, I remember reading an article about that maybe after you got done boxing, you talked about maybe attending the University of Maryland. Growing up, did you grow up watching Maryland athletics, Maryland sports, going to Coldfield House for any of the games? What did you do outside of boxing as a kid? Did you play other sports? Nope, nope. I was a shy kid. 
I was not athletically inclined or I was not gifted with any any particular uh, assets. Boxing was a sport that I tried out like back in, uh, God, I was like nine years old back in Washington, D.C., number two boys club. Number two. The, and the kid hit me in the nose. I quit that same day, okay? <laughs> I came back when I came to Palmer Park, Maryland. I put the gloves back on again, and I, I found boxing. Boxing found me, or we found each other. It was an inevitable that I became a boxer for some reason. Well, I know this, I know this champ, and before I let you go, you do a lot of great things in the community. You know, talk to us a little bit about your foundation, the Sugar Ray Leonard Foundation. I know you and your wife founded in 2009 to bring awareness uh, to type 1 and type 2 diabetes research. What things are you doing in that, in that arena now? You know what we do? We, we do what we do best. Uh, we put on this annual boxing event, uh, hosted actually Oscar De La Hoya and Golden Boy Promotions. Right. They provide the entertainment, the fighters. And we just generate money and awareness that goes towards type 1, type 2 diabetes, Children's Hospital Los Angeles. It's about giving back. Man. I'm a blessed man as yeah. a fighter. I've been in the ring almost 50 years, so I have come out somewhat unscathed. I'm okay. I'm giving back. Yeah. Well, man, uh, champ, you made my day. I didn't think we were going to be able to get this to happen before. This is my last show. And I yeah. told somebody, asked me, what, who would be your dream guest? And I said, man, I'd love to get Ray on here because he has no idea. He has a, I grew up with the number four police boys and girls club mm -hmm. in boxing and the Ham AC club. Ham was and yes, and Mark, yes. Mark Johnson, Two Sharp, all those guys grew up in my neighborhood. Uh, so the fight game, man, every time and any time we got, I mean, we went and watched you on closed circuit TV over at the stadium. I remember staying up late watching that Benitez. That's when y'all used to fight a, a lot of rounds. Exactly. But yeah. also, you you never respond. You didn't really respond to whether or not you were going to make a comeback with me. <laughs> you know what, Ray? Uh, if you end up in Maryland, and I hear that you, I hear you got a. I hear you got a grandson that might be a decent little football player, so there's a chance that uh, you may end up out this way. Maybe we can – it has to be shadow boxing. It I'll call to. you, man. I'll call you, man. Please do. Please Love do. Chance, I appreciate you for coming on, man. You made my day, man. You made the show. Good luck. Stay healthy, and we'll catch up soon. All right, man. Thanks. Take Thank care. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. Sugar Ray Leonard, man. You guys have no idea. Between him and Kyle Ripken, this show for me, uh, I've, I've had I've had my full. Not to say that our next two guests are chopped liver, because I'm super, super, super excited to bring on my next guest, uh, a person that I had a chance to, I actually, I guess you would call it Instagram bomber. Uh, I was up late one night and just going through Instagram, and I saw that uh, Kerry Champion was on Instagram Live, and I uh, hit the button, and she just happened to be just taking random people on and answering questions and having a conversation. And I thought it was a unique idea, Ben, as though I was doing this show. I said, well, maybe I can get on and convince her to come on my show. Uh, she had no idea who I was, she had no clue what I did for a living. So just goes to show you, man, what the type of person she is. Um, again, I mean, a lot of you guys will know her from ESPN. Uh, she's a native Californian. Um, she was a writer for the Daily Bruin at UCLA. Uh, graduated with a degree in English, English and mass communications. And we've seen her on the tennis channel. Uh, with, uh, she's been with Stephen A. Skip Bayless on first take sports nation all across the ESPN platform. Uh, former anchor of Sports Center, and now she's kind of ventured off into another another show. Uh, but most of you guys are just going to have an opportunity to meet somebody that's really good at what she does. Uh, we're going to try to get Carrie Champion on as we wait for her to come on. We're going to, uh, as we wait for her to come on. Thank you. A beer's telling me what to do behind. I can't see her. It's dark in here. As we wait for her to come on, we'll try to maybe get to some questions because I know that, uh, that she's going to uh, be coming here in just a second. Um, let's go to some of the questions that maybe we have not answered. Uh, what am I going to do now that the show is over? Now that this show is over, man, what am I going to do? Uh, 
you know what? I'm hoping that June 1st we maybe are able to start doing some football things per the NCAA. But uh, it's time for me to get back in the football coach mode and uh, do the things and have our team prepared in case we're able to play the great game of football. Man, I hope, you, I hope you're not driving and, 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 and FaceTiming and Instagram and all you care. Uh-uh, no, I'm not. My hands are free. I'm not driving. I parked. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, look, I just gave you a 20, 30-second introduction, and I was telling the story how I uh, Instagram live bombed you. Oh, and, yes. Uh, I loved it. I loved it. And, and I thought, I said, I'm going to use this to try to see if I can get her on our show. I've had opportunities to see, uh, you know, your work on ESPN, the, the, all the great things you're doing. Now you're doing a new show. Uh, mm -hmm. What's been up and what have you been doing, obviously, during the quarantine? Okay, so first off, I'm so happy to be on your show. Did I miss Sugar Ray Leonard? Yes, you just missed the chain. What did he say? <laughs> what did he say? I'm cleaning my clean room. What did he say? Is he, he, he asked me or challenged me to the ring. Oh. I think this might have been the first time I backed down from a fight. <laughs> I, I, I would fight. I you can, you can take them. I know you don't run from fights, but that's the chain. You know, I grew up. He grew up in the D.C. area. I grew up a great fan of Ray, so I, I didn't want any parts of being in the ring with Ray. I so think that you, you would have. I think you would have been able to win. I've been up to. Can I tell you what's going on? The reason why you because I'm I have been a little busy this week with the premiere of the show, and I wanted to be on your show so bad that even though I have to drive to my friend's house in Palm Springs because she's doing something for a little girl, I was like, I'm pulling over so I could talk to him. So no matter what is happening, I am going to talk to you on your show because it took me forever. So I'm safe. I'm parked. No, it's, it's perfect. And so that was why I'm in my car. Normally I'd be at home. Secondly, what I've been up to, I'm busy. I have so much going on. You know, I'm getting a new show on Vice with, with, with one of our former ESPN colleagues that's coming out in July. I haven't told anybody. That's breaking news right here for you. I, I saved it for you. Late yes. night with locks. Breaking news. <laughs> and, um, and our show for The Rock just premiered on Monday, and it was great. It was a really good show. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, we, we love The Rock over here because he's one of the big under armor uh sponsors he got his own line there with under armor who we obviously have a close relationship with and uh yeah i didn't have a chance to see the show but i did do a little funny I, I it was you. so funny i laughed so hard that was from season one that you did that and i thought that was so clever how did you do that that you're so clever well you know i got a great producer my assistant a beer uh you know, she's such a great producer. She came up with the theme. Uh, a lot of people really wanted to know if I was squatting the weight that I had up there. Yeah, she they wanted you to do more. They wanted to see it. So we may have to do some blooper reels. When, this is the, this is the show's, show's finale. So this is it. So you're, you're closing the house down with one more guest after you. Oh, well, who's the guest after me? Wait, there is, oh, Sean Payton. Sean Payton. No you, I mean, you are a baller. How'd you get everybody on the show? Ah, oh, man, that just shows you the power of the University of Maryland, the power of Coach Locks, the power of the DMV. This is the, this is the third largest media, uh, media thing in the country. We're the third largest. So we, we, people just want to come and, and be on the show. Can I tell you, somebody told me to tell you hi, but you already know him so well. He was like, I'm, I'm going to wait to catch you on Coach Locks' show. He sent me that message. Okay. Who is that? You, Jalen. Jalen Hurts. Yeah. Okay, look at that. I was like, I was like, I love a coach. I said, we besties right now. Yes, no doubt. Jalen was a was a great player for me, and he's gonna be a great, uh, even better pro. So, look, people want to know uh, what in the world did Kerry Champion? You know, what's the show about? The Titan Show. What is it all about? Okay, so the Titan Games is about um, people who are very much former athletes going up against professional athletes. So for instance, um, you might, you, you know how it is. Everybody wants to make it to the pros, but if you don't, you end up having a different career, but yet you stay in shape and you do something that keeps you motivated and focused. But all the while you still want that second opportunity, that second chance to perform on a big stage. And that's what you're allowed to do with the Titan games. You're allowed to perform on a big stage, talk to people, a lot of, you go up against a
a lot of a lot of professionals. Like we got we have Victor Cruz on the show. We have who's the other guy that we love? Uh, we got uh, the Iron Man. We got Joe Thomas on the show. You know, Clarissa Shields, the boxer. Right. She's on the show. I mean, I'm telling you, everybody's on the show and they're battling these really tough former athletes. And it's a great, I mean, it's good. It's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And you get to see DJ in a better, in, in a better light. You can see The Rock in a better light. Yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out. Now, I read somewhere where in college you did an internship out here in D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, Washington, with CNN. Mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what it was like for you here in the D.C. metro area. You're a West Coast, California girl. How'd you enjoy your opportunity to be here and do that internship? You are an excellent host. I hope your show gets, you need to be on year round. I know you have work to do, but you have, you've done a lot of work to do. I know, but you have done your homework and that's impressive because I'll go and stuff and talk to people they don't even know. But yeah, I love the DMV. I actually stayed in Boston, Virginia. And I also had two, I had two internships. I had one at Voice of America, VOA, and the one at CNN. And it was great. Like, I loved it. I love that area. It was beautiful. At the time, I think I didn't really appreciate everything. But what I do say about the nation's capital, I felt like I learned a lot while I was there. I don't know if you guys can understand when you're there. I mean, it's a lot of history. I mean, you have all the museums, you have the Smithsonian, you can go places, you learn a lot. And, I, and culturally, it is so diverse. And so for me, I loved all of that. So growing up in LA, you know, it's it's different. You don't go to school like that. It's very, very different. And I needed that culture. I needed that introduction. Man, you just did a recruiting spiel for me, which is why I gave you that layup. <laughs> I've been telling people here, like you had to come all the way across the country to do an internship. Yeah. Whereas if you played football here at the University of Maryland in the summer, you literally hop on the subway, you go do yes. the internship, and yep. you come back and you do football. Yeah, and I went to how I got to visit Howard, which was great for me because I didn't get to go to the HBCU. I wanted to, but my mom was like, you can't leave California. I just, it was just a good experience. I, To me, I, I love it there. I always say, it. and the weather was good for me. I was in there in the summer. I know it snows, but still, it's just beautiful. You learn so much. I think everybody needs to do a turn there. Everybody. I love it. Everybody needs to be a turf. Go ahead and say it. I yeah, mean, <laughs> everyone. I don't know if I can say that <laughs> in case you got some Bruins watching, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I get it. So also, I know, you know, t- today, the last couple of days have been really tough, obviously, with the things that have taken place in Minneapolis. And you happen to have a nonprofit that you're a part of, the Brown Girls Dream. Mm -hmm. What is it? What inspired you to create this foundation? Talk a little bit about Brown Girls Dream. Well, I think for me, it's just because I, growing up, I knew what I wanted to do, and I didn't have that many people who looked like me who could help me because there's so many of us who feel like there can only be one. And so I wanted to kind of, especially in a very competitive world you know about competition i love to compete i'm super competitive but i also know that you should help others as well and i and i just wanted to be able to be uh, an outlet for the next generation help them give them like basically hold the door open because it's not easy and you know it's not easy being excellent at anything isn't easy but being brown and excellent and competing in a world that you know doesn't always tell us when we're excellent and that our best is just bare minimum you know and it's unfair so i created an internship that's extremely informal um but is to help um young women of color who want to and by color i mean our brown body sisters our, our black body sisters our yellow bodied sisters everybody who just needs a, a handout a connection because for some reason, we feel like we can't help our own, and we can. Like, I want to be able to give you an alley oop. I want to be able to call somebody and say, "Give this person an internship or a job or what have you." So, that's what I do, and it's 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 thriving. And we got some great, phenomenal women who are doing some great some great things. And it blows my mind how quick it's gone. I've only had it for two years, and it's been very successful. And I'm just I'm just blessed and fortunate. Well, when I when I Instagram bombs your live. <laughs> two or three of them that happen to be on there because I heard you keep saying there's one of my mentees and one of my yeah. interns and yeah. uh, it was really great to hear and see that especially yeah. with the last couple of days and how tough they've been and uh, the things going on in Minneapolis right. um, really hard really tough um, to, to watch and to see um, now I'm this is talk show stuff is like this is a hobby for me but I actually kind of like it because I like to connect I'm a people person. I always ask this question. I had Kirk Herbstreet on here. I had Reese. 
like get what's your most memorable interview who who did you really really enjoy or like like i just got the fuck got done fanboying sugar ray leonard <laughs> <laughs> call me ray groupie who, who, who's the guy who's the person um, i have a couple right so to me someone i really enjoyed interviewing versus somebody i, I found out they're usually two different types of interviews but um God bless the dead. I love Kobe Bryant. And the first time that I got to interview him, I've interviewed him a couple of times. But the first time was a real, a real like full circle moment for me because I grew up in LA. I grew up watching him as a kid. Um, he narrated so many good parts, of, so many good wins for me in my life, like going to Laker parades after they win the chip. Uh, him and Shaq were really just my my Laker era, right? And right. then meeting Magic for the first time was, you know, that was Hall of Fame for me. So that was another, those three for me, because you have to realize that that's the reason why I love sports. Basketball is one of my favorite sports, if not the. And then I get to meet the greats that, you know, were a part of me growing up and, and signified so much of my love for sports and how I grew up and why I love LA so much. So um, those were the mayors I call of the city. And then uh, when I, <laughs> that's kind of funny. Um, but then when I got to interview Robin Roberts at a summit to watch her and see her, um, in her in her fullness right now, how she's been able to grow in so many different ways. And then her telling me that she was a fan of mine and she recognized this, that, and the third. I was just like, wow, that, you know, when people you admire, admire you, it's just a, it's a, it's a wonderful moment. And so, that for me were some of my great moments. Of, yeah, for my Robin career. Roberts. Robin is a pioneer in this business, and yeah. her versatility to go from yeah ESPN to hosting and anchoring Good Morning America. And that, she's that, amazing. That, that, she's that amazing. Maybe yeah. next year. Maybe next year I'll call you to talk to see if you could talk to Robin to see if I can get Robin on. Oh yeah, two. I'll give you an alley oop to that. Please, anybody yeah. I know, anybody, anybody you think I know, yes, I will hook you up. Easy breezy, that's easy. Well, I know that you're on your way to Palm Springs. I won't. I know, you, life is hard. You already let the cat out the bag because you got some other things up your sleeve with your new project. On I didn't Vice. say who I was working with, but you're gonna you love it. You're gonna love her. I just said, oh yeah, you're gonna love it and you're gonna but, love her. But I, but I knew you had some up your sleeve, so. We appreciate you breaking that news on Late Night with Locks. Drive safe, keep your hands and seatbelt on, hands on the wheel. Always. And get there safe. But thank you so much for coming on, and we'll stay in touch. Coach, thank you. Don't take my job, okay? Uh, I won't. I'm going to try to see if I can win some football games. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Carrie. Carrie Champion. Carrie Champion. How, how exciting it is to be able to speak to a person. Uh, so talented. Um, she doesn't have to worry about me taking her job. All she has to, I'm, I'm out of here after today. So, uh, Carrie, you're, you're, you're safe. Uh, I mean, we're going to keep the thing hopefully moving right along because the next person is a guy that, uh, it's a funny story how we first met. And I'm going to wait till he comes on to, uh, to talk about it. But I'm excited to bring him on, former quarterback of the Eastern Illinois Panthers, Played both in the Arena League, the CFL, and the NFL, as he likes to call himself a spare bear uh, during the strike season uh, for Chicago. Uh, he was the 2006 Coach of the Year in his first year with the Saints. Took his team to Super Bowl 44 and won in 2010. The leader of the Saints, Sean Payton. What's happening with you, Sean? Coach Lott, listen, I appreciate you having me on. But man, I gotta follow that lineup. You just get you just gave everyone like am I the last person on your show? You say the best for last. This is it for the season finale. We we at some point we thought we were gonna have one person that you would know very well that uh planned on coming on after you. He's playing running back for the Ravens, but he hasn't gotten back to us just yet. He said he was coming on, but maybe he was, maybe he isn't. Uh he planned on trying to come on after you, but I think we're gonna close it up with you, man. Listen, when you finished interviewing and I had a chance to listen, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. You had Sugar Ray on. I almost just decided to just hang up and just text you and say, I don't have any service. Well, that's unbelievable. Well, I'm a fanboy when it comes to Ray Leonard, man. I grew up in this area. And if you remember, yeah. man, that 76 gold champion, gold medalist, uh, all those great fights. I mean, that was back when the fight game was 
18 rounds yep. and just Absolutely. Yeah, stay up late and watch it on TV. It wasn't pay-per-view. Those were the good Friday old night. <laughs> he had a, he he spoke to our team. I want to say three or four years ago, and did a fantastic job. Um, man, I appreciate you having me on. And and look, it seems like yesterday, but it, how long was it ago? What was two? Was it ninety seven? Nineteen ninety seven. Nineteen ninety seven. A young coach from West Point. I was coaching at West Point, and. Uh, this is where we first met, and a lot of people don't know this story that are following this thing here. There was a young coach, and this was really – when I got hired at Maryland in 97 by Ron Vanderland, and I was told it would be either running backs or receivers. And he said it all depends what Sean Payton wants to do. Sean was an assistant here at Maryland from, I want to say, December through, through, through signing day. And then uh, – yeah. And through signing day of 97, and then went out to the uh, combine and got offered a quality control job with the Eagles. And as your moving truck was coming to College Park to drop off a lot of other stuff, because you came from Illinois with Lou Tepper and Chris Koch, the moving truck just kept going and went up to Philadelphia. And your it, NFL it, career was born. But that is the three degrees of separation where I was hired and I was told, you might be running backs and you might be receivers, but we got to figure out which one Sean wants to do because you coach the hey. great Marshall Falk in San Diego with San Diego State. You coach quarterbacks at Illinois. You're a guy that coached a lot of positions like I have. Talk a little bit about your path, man, and how you've uh, been able to, you know, the college game, the NFL game, and maybe who are some of the coaches that have impacted your uh, career? Yeah, absolutely. I, The one thing that comes to mind, and it was advice I got a long time ago. You know, I grew up in the Midwest, so home for me was just outside Chicago. And and look, when you're finished playing, and that, that time can be different for whether you're a high school athlete, college athlete, or professional athlete. You know, you want to play as long as you can. And then I knew I wanted to coach, and I wanted to, I wanted to coach in the Big Ten. I mean, I grew up uh, – you know, watching Michigan, watching Illinois, Michigan State, uh, Purdue. I grew up in, in that part of the world, world where I wanted to be a college coach. And I, I never thought at all about coaching in the NFL. And so for me, much like many of us, you know, you go out and get a graduate assistant position. You go to clinics. You hustle, hustle. You're, 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 you're constantly trying to visit a high school, a college. Uh, you're trying to – Two things. You're trying to learn more about the game. And then number two, you're trying to meet people that you can make an impression with that some day, maybe not that day, but down the road, it'll mean something. And yeah, I started as a graduate assistant at San Diego State then went to Indiana State, which was that was my first full time job. So that's the first time I had health insurance. I had a, a little courtesy car. I was recruiting, had a sycamore leaf on the side of it. So it wasn't real sexy. But anyway, it, it worked. And uh, and then I got hired back to San Diego State full time. Um, went from there to Miami of Ohio for two seasons, and then Illinois, Mike. And and you were just hitting on it. That was for me when I went to Illinois. That was man. I, I grew I grew up there, and I went to school at Eastern Illinois. I wasn't good enough right. to go to Illinois, but that for me as a position coach was like, man, this is the Big Ten. You know, I could take my shoes off here and and just work. Um, but after that finished, I came to Maryland with Coach Tepper, met you, and Ron Vanderlinden, and we were putting our staff together. And you can remember this now, and for your, your people listening, this look, Coach v, Coach Vanderlinden is trying to put a staff together. It's December, we're recruiting, yeah. and you got to pick up on the fly, ready, ready, you know. And so you're hustling. And one month in, Coach Tep decided, hey, he 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 wanted to wait, and look. That was a big loss for, for Vandy because Tep was like a father to him. Those two had been together, worked together. So, But but Lou felt more comfortable going back, and so that was change number one. And then I want to say about three weeks later, Terry Malone, Terry Malone went to Michigan. And, and he was on our new staff. He, he, he was like the, we were all staying at the University Inn, I think. And uh, – we had 60 days we had to get out. So I was like on day 58 getting ready to move into the night's end. And, but Terry Malone got an offer, and, and it was a, at Michigan where his father 
was from and his, his right. father at that time was was sick with cancer and so that made a ton of sense he went in and saw vandy and ron was good and then came into the staff meeting he said hey anybody else who wants to get out of here now all right i'm gonna and then we were all looking at each other like ah that's not gonna affect us man three days later i'm like man i'm that person <laughs> like I was the third person out of the bank. <laughs> you, you don't want to be the third person out of the bank. No. And uh, now, fortunately, uh, Ron was great, and it was an opportunity in Philly. And that would be – look, my high school coach played such an important role for me. But that two years there in Philly with, with Coach Gruden and, and, and that staff, Ray Rhodes and Emma Thomas and, look, Joe Vitt uh, – on that staff, John Harbaugh, David Shaw, all right, Juan Castillo. There, a lot of head coaches came on that staff. John Gruden went on. He's the head coach now in Vegas. Uh, John Harbaugh, the head coach of Baltimore. David Shaw winning games at Stanford. Um, man, that was like a young Rat Pack staff at, at the old Veteran Stadium. And so – but I would say this, Mike – to, to any young coach or, or as you give advice and you're always talking to our children, man, if you just handle your job where your feet are on the ground, everything else will take care of itself. And I, you try to tell young people that it's great to get out and work and hustle and expose yourself to different systems. Man, we got in the car, drove to see the Steelers one afternoon from Miami, Ohio, and it was fantastic. Like people will, will work with you, but, but I see sometimes the mistake of guys always anxious for the next job as opposed to just focus on that job you have and, and you watch everything else will take care of itself. And, and that really happened for me. I ended up with the Giants as a coordinator. And, man, I ended up getting hired by Parcells I'd never met before and went to him with, for, for the Cowboys. And then my first head coaching job came in 06 with New Orleans. And uh, Parcells had a huge influence. Uh, I was blessed with a lot of important figures. You know, my high school coach was important. Um, man, Randy Walker, the late Randy Walker at Miami of Ohio was a, was a fantastic coach. Yes, he was. But being around, you know, just uh, I was exposed. And I think that's another thing, the importance of being around winning. And, and you know this, man, the, the winner shines. And so even if that level of play is a Division two or 1AA school or – or what is it now? It's not one double A. It's uh, it's not BCS. What's the other one? FBC or FBS? F yeah. If you're oh, if you're FCS. winning, I'm sorry, FCS. Those people hiring want to hire winners, and uh, and you know that. And so, I was fortunate. There's there's some good luck along that on the way, um, but I think that. Look, every one of us has got a journey. We've sold houses. We've moved families. When when I was with you, my wife was nine months pregnant at the time. I remember. And, and look, that was – look, we were all scrambling. I mean, I remember just going up there to Philly, coming back. And you're right. When you say the moving truck literally sat in College Park and I was ready to close on a home and I had to tell the lady I, I had to get out of the close of the home, I, I, I hated that because it was – man, it was literally days, not weeks – and uh but i was a terp i was there with you and i've heard so many good things now just had a chance to follow your career i'm on the committee with mike tomlin the competition committee and i know man you're close with him and and mike t and i are real close and, and uh you're doing a great job there i appreciate that man you know the thing about the moving truck if you don't recall which i do because doug mallory and i still stay pretty tight and go on vacation together it was like three of your guys is houses were all on this truck and you just happen to have your stuff like maybe in the middle of the truck you already packed three houses on one truck and yeah, so absolutely it was, a, a, <laughs> it was a fiasco trying to figure out whose stuff was who because the delivery got kind of screwed up man but i do know this you went on had a, a have had a great career you won a super bowl there in new orleans and, a, and you won during a time very similar to what we're going through now uh you know you guys had the hurricane and and you showed so much leadership during that time. Talk a little bit about what it was like leading your team through the hurricane and through some of the things that a lot of us as coaches are going to have to do now. Yeah, I, I think this, one of the things that, uh, that, that stuck out to me was, man, when you are 
when you are finishing, when you're getting in a job, there's chances are you're taking a job over for a reason. There, there's been some things that have been broken. And the challenge for us immediately was Katrina. The team was relocating. So you had schools that weren't open. You had hospitals that weren't open. And, and you're trying to get your coaching staff there. You're trying to bring all these people in. And there came a point where I remember that year on our staff was like, hey, we're not we're just not going to allow Katrina to be the reason. In other words, we recognized how challenging that was for the reason, region. But, man, it was not going to be the reason we weren't successful. And I think that challenge happens. It's happening in a different way, Mike. But today, you know, you're trying to get ready. There's a lot of apprehension with your players, families, uh, our players' families. You and I are in the same position. We're waiting a little bit for guidance. We're waiting for some, some, uh, Answers. some closure here. Yeah, I mean, because it's still it's still uncertain, right. and yet you know what though, man, we got to be we got to be able to kick butt regardless of COVID. Right. You, you follow me? Because no one really is going to care. Right. You, you know, and the good news is everybody in your conference on your schedule's got to deal with. It. Everybody on our schedule's got to deal with it. And so whether there's ten people in the crowd or a hundred thousand people in the crowd, all uh, right, that's that's not going to be a reason why we're not successful. And so it's kind of keeping focus on the things that we can control. And, and this, we have no control over. Zero. Zero. I read, a, I read a quote, and I thought it was like old school. I loved it, where everybody now is trying to figure out how can we get practices, OTAs, mini camps, whatever. And you say, look, my team, we're going to show up whenever they open up. Just be ready to go play. Has that been your message? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just look. I this virtual. First of all, virtual to me to me means it never really happened. All right, so we're having meetings that are happening, and we're doing it with our young players, our draft picks. We're getting them up to speed, but I wanted some calmness in the lives of our players. And and there's two things I knew: just take care of your families. All right, wherever you're located, and take care of them. All right. And then number two, begin to get in shape. Everyone's got their own niche now. And I recognize there's some challenges with that. But you and I both know we can get in shape. I'm going to get I challenge them. I'm going to be in this condition in test come come July. And if I finish ahead of any one of y'all, we got a problem. <laughs> right. That's right. I mean, that's an issue. So I felt like I wanted to reduce the questions of these guys that were saying, hey, are we going to be coming in June? Are we good? Because they, they, there's a lot of other things going on. I'll see you in training camp. 2011, when we had the lockout, we didn't have virtual meetings. Listen, the players were locked out, and then that benefited the veteran teams, and we started training camp on time, and we were fine. But I wanted I wanted some calm and, and some a little bit of closure relative to what's going to happen here during June and July. So I'll – I'm waiting for the NFL's training camp protocol. Our team will be ready. And then, hey, we got to we gotta prepare accordingly. We, we might have to be careful with soft tissue injuries when we get started. It's going to put a premium on the players that can learn. Right. And uh, – but, look, it's exciting because, look, we get, we, we get to do it. It, it. It's just one other reason, all right, we got to figure out how to do this despite the challenge. And uh, so that's exciting. Well, unlike Katrina, everybody's dealing with this. And with Katrina, that was something that I know people down in that area and that region did. Now, before I let you go, and I know you've been asked this a lot, obviously we are in the situation we are in because of COVID. And you were one of the first kind of superstar coaches uh, to come out that, that actually tested positive for COVID. Talk a little bit about what the – what that experience was like for you and some of the things you're doing now, and obviously having gone through it to kind of help educate people. Yeah. Look real early, probably first week of March, I had some symptoms and talked with our team doctor. I, I didn't have any respiratory issues. I didn't have any uh, fever really. I had the, I had kind of, you feel like when you have a normal flu, I had the chills, you know, you get up and you want to get back into bed. And, and so shortly after I got a test and, and by the time it came back, back then it was taking four days to get a test back. I was already beginning to feel better. So I was fortunate to have had it, to have had it in, in March and then recover 
quarantined for two weeks, even longer than that. And then two weeks ago, I started giving blood plasma, which is a whole nother, it's a process because you've got the antibodies that they're able to take that and, and give it to those COVID patients that are in, in, in dire need. So um, to some degree, it, 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 I'm not going to say it was a blessing, but it, it all of a sudden, it's like you had it. Now, don't get me wrong. The first time I was out, call it easily 27, 28 days free, I'm at a subway in Mobile, and I kind of looked. There's a few people in there, and they looked at Mike, you know, and it's not that look like they know it's the coach, but there was more than that. <laughs> so I had to address the elephant in the room. <laughs> and I said, look, I'm okay. <laughs> you want my temperature? I'm the, I'm the safest person in here right now. Uh, so I kind of feel like I'm past that a little bit. <laughs> so people, people not, are not afraid of, of being next to you. Yeah, but but it, listen, for a little bit, though, it was kind of like, man, do I got a booger in my nose or something? <laughs> <laughs> Just getting that funny look. <laughs> now, here's the last thing, and I'm going to let you go because you look like you might be very hit some golf ball. You know, I, I, I know there's some people. I read something about you being one of the first jump man coaches, man. A jump man coach, Nate. We've got players that have jumped, that, that have signed to the Jordan brain. And you, I saw the ones you had on in the uh, at the draft. You had the uh, the the the, uh, the zeros or the elevens on in one of those. Days. Yeah. And how does that come about? How does a coach become a jump man coach? Listen, Mike Thomas, our receiver, is with is with the Jordan brand, and he wears the same size shoe as I do, thirteens, and so. Man, early in his career, he started catching touchdowns, and all of a sudden, there'd be a box of shoes on my desk. And I'd say, Mike, where the, he's like, well, you wear the 13s. And I'm like, all right. And so they're comfortable. And then I would remind Mike, look, I was watching Jordan before you were born. I'm from Chicago. I was in college when he was drafted in 84. Like, I can remember a lot of what we just saw in this documentary, and yet there were a lot of things you forget. And so years later, I had a chance uh, this past year to go down and, and become a member of his golf course. And uh, it's a fantastic place in Florida. I met him for the first time, and he made the comment like, hey, I see you're, you're in Jordan's on game day. And I told him what I just told you. I said, hey, Mike Thomas is taking care of me. And then he said, look, you're going to be my first – you're going to be my first Jordan coach. And I kind of look, Mike, now when you – and I'm like, all right. And I'm thinking, yeah, all right, whatever. And then – Two weeks later, I get a funny email from somewhere I didn't see, and then I get a call from his guy, uh, a good friend now, and and sure enough, it's uh, it's happened. But but here's the thing, Mike, and you sent me a picture, and I'm not going to put it up here, but there are some <laughs> undercover people. There are. Look, there are. You guys, you know what? You guys I'm, I'm going to send you all of those Steph Currys, all of those Under Armour. We're going to make you an Under Armour coach. <laughs> That's what I mean, and so I recognize the rivalry here. All right, and I get it. But uh, the importance of your players feeling good about what they're playing in, yeah. that's a big deal. And the importance of recruiting, and I know you're kicking up with that, that's a big deal. And so it was all kind of happening right during this documentary, which which is just really the uh, timing. But look, he's, he's been fantastic to, to meet and get to know, and, uh, and his shoes are comfortable to look. You know, they're, they're, they're scholarships, so we'll take them. No doubt. Well, we're going, I'm going to make sure I at least have our people at Under Armour send you some of the Steph Currys and see how you like those. You can try them out. You know, if it'll help my swing. You may, may be able to help your swing. Yeah. You know, Tom Brady, yeah. Brady plays in the Under Armour stuff, too. So, you know, we, we'll see what we can do. Look, man, I, I, I appreciate this. This this is you, – you're now officially forgiven for taking Corey Robinson. You've uh, you, you paid your you paid your debt to me by coming on. It was great catching up with you. I used to be able to run into you at the coaches convention, but you, you don't come to that very often anymore because you you out golfing a lot probably. But man, I appreciate you coming on. I wish you luck in your season as you guys start your preparation. Hopefully, here in the next coming uh, month or two. And again, if you need anything up here in the DMV. Please don't hesitate to reach out, man. I will, Mike. Thank you for having me on, too. I appreciate no it. Good luck to your team. Appreciate it, Sean. Sean Payton, man. Super Bowl winning coach. Uh, another great friend. A guy that uh, has done an awful lot in, in his career. 
about the untold story of how he was a Turk assistant. A lot of people don't know and understand that he spent a month and a half here. He actually played a part in recruiting Lamont Jordan to come being a Turk. Uh, and I had, to, I had to wait for him to decide if he wanted to coach running backs or receivers uh, when I was hired. So uh, I took second to Sean Payton and had to pick there. But look, thank you guys for all the love on Late Night with Locks. This was a great season finale. Uh, the show has been amazing. This thing, as I said before, started out as an idea uh, with our staff and a way to stay relevant while we had everybody's attention on the University of Maryland, uh, all things DMV, all things Maryland, all things Coach Locks. And it what really shows you the power of the Maryland brand and the power of being here. You heard Kerry Champion talk about the location and how a lot of us take it for granted living right here in the most powerful city in the world with so many opportunities here. Um, I want to thank all of our guests for making the time. I always tell people time is our most valuable commodity. And when people give you their time, they're giving you something of great value. So I want to thank you guys for making the show such a success. You're the reason people came on. Uh, I hope this show has been a getaway for many of you guys to get your mind off the pandemic uh, as we hopefully move into phase one of opening up our country uh, along with all the uh, issues, social issues going on in America. I just want to pray that everyone is safe and that we all can figure out a way uh, to do things the right way. That's, that's what we ask. Do things the right way. Um, I hope this show has been a getaway for you. Continue to be safe. Practice good social distancing. Follow the protocols that are in place. We don't want this thing to come back and have to do this again. I promise you, I don't want to have to do late night with locks in June, July, or August because we're not practicing good social distancing. Um, so follow the guidelines. Thank you. And locks is out. Dropping the mic. Thank you,